The next item of business is a statement by Shona Robison on the introduction of the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. And before I call the Cabinet Secretary, I would like to make a few brief remarks to the Chamber. There is a great deal of interest in the work of the Parliament on this issue, and as always, it is important that we set the correct tone in our debate. The Parliament is charged with careful scrutiny of any proposed legislation and debates many issues about which people feel very passionately. In our debate, we must be able to hear each other and to treat each other with respect, even when we disagree wholeheartedly. We can accept that there are opposing views while not sharing them. And I am sure that all members will consider very carefully, as always, not just their choice of words, but the spirit and tone in which they are delivered. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Shona Robison, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I have introduced the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill, which proposes reforms to simplify the process for trans men and women to obtain a gender recognition certificate. It is now for this Parliament to consider this bill. Trans people in Scotland risk inequality, harassment and abuse simply for living their lives. They are amongst the most marginalised in our society. Recent Police Scotland statistics show increases in hate crimes with a transgender aggravator. As a society and a parliament, we have a responsibility to protect and support minority groups at risk of harm. Under the Equality Act, we have a legal duty to address discrimination against those with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment. And Scotland must have a system of gender recognition in order to comply with international human rights law. The current system has been in place for the past 18 years. There is evidence from extensive consultation, two of the largest ever undertaken by the Scottish Government and also a UK Government consultation, that applicants find the current system intrusive and invasive, overly complex and demeaning. Many trans people do not apply because of these barriers. And that is why we propose to reform the process to make it simpler, more streamlined, more compassionate and less medicalised. Our proposals for change and progress have caused discussion and debate. We know there are people who have campaigned for such changes for years. We know there are others who have concerns. This afternoon, I will seek to allay some of those concerns by explaining what the Bill does and, importantly, what it does not do. It does not introduce new rights or remove rights. It does not change public policy or prevent single-sex services being offered where appropriate. It does not change rules or conventions in place and in place for years under the current system, for example, access to toilets and changing rooms. Presiding officer, and to anyone listening, I want to be clear. I will listen to the views of everyone, parliamentarians in this chamber and those out with, in a respectful manner throughout the passage of this bill. And I urge everyone to do the same as you did at the outset. When it comes, when it comes to gender recognition, also wider issues concerning trans people, from healthcare to access to services, discussion has often become heated. I've often found the tone of debate on social media to be angry, unpleasant and abusive, both of trans people and of those who oppose gender recognition reform. I'm concerned about the impact all of this has, but particularly how it further stigmatises and marginalises trans people in Scotland. This isn't just an unacceptable way to behave towards each other. It's also unhelpful in getting a point of view across. We can disagree on issues without being offensive or abusive. My meetings with stakeholders have shown that it's possible to have constructive, respectful conversations about this bill. And I ask that this parliament leads by example and that we work together to set a tone of respectful discussion with a focus on the specific reforms in this bill, just as we've done in the past, for example, with same-sex marriage, which faced significant opposition at the time. Trans people have been able to apply for legal gender recognition through a Gender Recognition Certificate, or a GRC, since 2004. Obtaining a GRC means that a trans person is legally recognised in their acquired gender and can obtain a new birth certificate showing that gender. Not all trans people have a gender recognition certificate, and no one is required to have one. 
The UK Government estimates that there are up to 500,000 trans people in the UK, of whom only around 6,000 have a GRC. Those without a GRC will often have made other changes, including to passports, driving licences and other official documentation. The Bill's reforms will move the law closer to how people are already living their lives. For clarity, the GRC provides the legal recognition of changing a birth certificate, and I will say again, has been in place and a right for 18 years. And it's this mechanism for obtaining this that we are changing, nothing else. We're not introducing new rights for trans people, and importantly, we are not removing or changing any for women and girls. Central to the proposed reforms is removing the medical element of the process. We propose that GRCs be issued on the basis of statutory declaration made by the applicant rather than on a judgment by a tribunal based on a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. The World Health Organization's revised International Classification of Diseases, approved in 2019, redefined gender identity-related health, removing it from a list of mental and behavioural disorders. They took this step to reflect evidence that trans-related identities are not conditions of mental ill health, and classifying them as such can cause distress. Moving to a system based on personal declaration rather than medical diagnosis will bring Scotland into line with well-established systems in Norway, Denmark and Ireland, and recent reforms in Switzerland and New Zealand. We are aware of at least 10 countries that have introduced similar pr uh, processes. The process will remain serious and substantial. Making a false application will be an offence with penalties of up to two years imprisonment or an unlimited fine. The meetings that I've had over recent months while finalising the Bill for introduction have allowed me to hear the range of views directly from stakeholders. I've heard from those who have concerns and I've heard about the experiences of trans people who have been through the current process. This follows two of the largest consultations ever undertaken by the Scottish Government. The first in November 2017 sought views on the general principles of reform. It received over 15,500 responses, with 60% agreeing that applicants for legal gender recognition should no longer need to produce medical evidence. In December 2019, a second consultation on a draft bill received over 17,000 responses. And while this was qualitative, an analysis of group responses showed a majority supported reform. We have published independent analysis of both consultations, providing a, a valuable summary of the range of views. And whilst I know through meetings that I have had that for some we are not going far enough and that others would like us not to have a bill at all, the evidence overall from the consultations strengthens the argument for reform and shows that there is significant support for reforming the process of gender recognition. Our consultations provide clear evidence of the negative impact the current system can have on trans people. So did the UK Government consultation in 2018 and its LGBT survey in 2017. Many respondents described the process as outmoded and discriminatory, overly complicated, humiliating and invasive. And despite living in their gender for many years, many trans people have not applied for a certificate for those reasons. I've heard about individuals' experiences of exclusion, of a trans woman who had transitioned nearly 30 years previously and therefore found the evidence requirements impossible, of a trans man whose gender specialist had retired and NHS records had been lost and now can't obtain a GRC despite having changed their passport and all other ID. The analysis report also sets out the concerns of those who do not want reform, I know that some people are concerned about the potential impact on women and girls. I have met with a number of people in groups and I recognise that they feel deeply affected. I am also well aware of the real and legitimate concerns about violence, abuse and harassment women and girls face in our society. But trans people are not responsible for that abuse. Indeed, they often face it themselves. We still live in a society where, unfortunately, it's not hard to find sexist or misogynistic beliefs where women and girls face violence at the hands of men. And that's abhorrent. And this government is tackling that head on, providing support for services and focusing on prevention. But we must be clear. 
All of the evidence tells us that the cause of violence against women and girls is predatory and abusive men, not trans people. And importantly, we must not conflate the two. There is no evidence that predatory and abusive men have ever had to pretend to be anything else to carry out abusive and predatory behaviour. So, presiding officer, we are committed to advancing equality for women and protecting women's rights. That commitment is not affected by our support for trans rights. We strongly support the rights and protections that women have under the 2010 Equality Act, including single-sex exceptions. This part of the Act means that there is an exception applied to the protected characteristic of gender reassignment. In practice, this means that trans people can be excluded from single-sex services in some circumstances where that is proportionate and justifiable. The Act's explanatory notes gives an example of a group counselling session for female victims of sexual assault. This bill does not amend the Equality Act. Nothing in this bill will erode or undermine women's rights. Some of the concerns I've heard relate to issues under the current system, which it's argued will be compounded by our reforms. For example, concerns about policies implemented by service providers for changing rooms and toilets. Other than for communal residential accommodation, the Equality Act does not apply exceptions specifically to toilets and changing rooms. Trans people can and do use these now, whether they have a GRC or not, and they have been using them for many years. The Bill's proposals have no direct effect on single-sex spaces, but I have heard arguments that suggest an indirect effect on two grounds, that there will be a significant increase in people obtaining gender recognition or that the Bill will drive a, a wider social shift. Based on international comparison, particularly with Ireland, which introduced a similar process seven years ago, we estimate the number of applications might rise from around 30 to between 250 and 300 per year a small number in the context of the Scottish population. I have considered this and agree that we should monitor the impact of the changes, as with all legislation. I have therefore introduced new provision requiring annual reporting, including on the numbers applying for and obtaining a GRC, which I hope will provide some assurance. On the second argument about a wider societal shift, it is true that society moves on and attitudes change. We have seen that already with same-sex marriage, civil partnerships and with the Pardons Act. There is greater equality and acceptance in how we live our lives, who we love and how we solemnise our relationships, and surely that is a good thing. The acceptance and better understanding of trans people is another positive shift in society. The recent BBC poll shows that the general public is more accepting on trans inclusion than looking at social media would suggest, particularly among young people and women. The trans community, like everyone else, have a right to live their lives without fear of prejudice and abuse. Presiding officer, the bill proposes that applicants must have lived in their acquired gender, but the, the minimum period for this should be reduced from two years to three months, with an additional three-month reflection period. Some have argued for removing the requirement altogether, others to keep it at two years. Our view is that this approach strikes the right balance and provides valuable assurance. We consulted on whether to lower the current minimum age for applicants of 18 to 16. We have carefully considered this, examining different views and evidence, and it is a question that is finely balanced. We have examined comparable systems in other countries where a range of approaches are taken, including parental consent, a role for the courts, or requiring evidence, and we have considered these within a Scottish context. Those who have raised concerns say that under-18s are too young to make such an important decision. However, 16-year-olds can leave home, get a full-time job, change their name, consent to medical treatment, marry and vote. Earlier this week, the Cabinet met with the Scottish Youth Parliament and members spoke eloquently about how young trans people feel excluded by a system that denies them access to legal recognition, particularly, for example, in the case of someone wanting to make the legal change before moving into further or higher education or employment. We also recognise that these are important decisions, and it is vital that everyone applying to the process, especially young people, fully understand and carefully consider uh, before doing so. We have concluded that the minimum age should be reduced to 16, with support and guidance provided to young people through schools, 
third sector bodies and the national records of Scotland. Under the oversight of the Registrar General, National Records of Scotland will routinely give additional and careful consideration of applications from 16 and 17 year olds. They will support, uh, provide support on the process and where necessary will undertake sensitive investigation and this could include face to face conversations with applicants. Every 16 or 17 year old who applies will be offered and encouraged to take up the option of a conversation with NRS to talk through the process. One other change since publication of the draft bill relates to the power to charge an application fee. There should be no financial barrier to achieving legal gender recognition. The draft bill included a power for the Registrar General to set a fee for applications. That has been removed. It is our view that no fee should be charged and removing the power gives a clear commitment to this. Finally, Presiding Officer, four of the five parties in this chamber made clear their support for reform in their recent manifestos. However, I recognise that for individuals, just as within the public, there may be a range of views. I understand the views and concerns of those who oppose the reforms, and just because they disagree with the proposals, people should not be automatically labelled as transphobic. If everyone is respectful, we should all be able to discuss the proposals and our views in a civilised manner. However, it is clear... It is clear that transphobia exists, and as elected representatives, we must ensure that transphobic discourse does not seize onto the concerns that people have about this bill. It is in this context it is so important that we discuss our differences of opinion and consider the evidence in a way that is measured and respectful. And I will maintain an open-door policy for MSPs who want to discuss any aspect of the bill. Presiding officer, following some of the most ext extensive consultation ever undertaken in Scotland, the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill is now introduced and sets out the Scottish Government's proposal for a balanced and proportionate way of improving the current system. It is now for this Parliament to consider. I am happy to take questions. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 30 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons now or enter R in the chat function. And I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. On behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's tone of her statement? I agree with her that we must be constructive and respectful when discussing this important but polarised piece of legislation. The Scottish Conservatives recognise improvements to the system would be beneficial for trans people. We will constructively scrutinise the proposals in the Bill that we help to make the system and the process easier. However, the proposals as they stand do not protect women's rights. They do not offer enough protection for women's safety. The concerns of women are legitimate. They are reasonable. They are honestly and sincerely held. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree to listen again to the valid concerns of women who feel that their rights are under threat? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I first thank Megan Gallagher for her tone and for her uh, offer for constructive scrutiny. I think that is very welcome. Um, First of all, on the, the issue of, of women's uh, rights and safety concerns and all of those being sincerely held, of course they are sincerely held, and I, in my statement, have not suggested otherwise. And of course, uh, we have, and I have, listened to those concerns. I understand those concerns, which is why I'm making one of the reasons I'm making this extended uh, statement to Parliament today. But we have to, as legislators, always look at the evidence. The evidence is critical here. And all of the evidence, as I said in my statement, shows that the, the threat to women and girls' safety comes from predatory and abusive men, not the trans community. Also, if you look at the experience of those 10 countries, some of which have had this in place, Ireland, for example, for seven years, 
There is no evidence that the, some of the fears that Megan Gallagher uh, outlined have, have come to pass. So we have to look at the evidence. And I'm sure that is what this Parliament will collectively do through the work of the committee and through the work uh, that, that we will do on a cross-party basis. So let's make sure we look at the evidence. But I do welcome her tone. Thank you. I call Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement and the tone today. Presiding Officer, this is about rights, and this Parliament has been bold before with Section 2A or known as Section 28, and we can and I hope we will be bold again. Trans people's rights are human rights. They must be treated with the same dignity and respect as everyone else. Right now, the process of getting a gender recognition certificate does not do that. It is lengthy and traumatic, which is why we support reform of the Gender Recognition Act and to demedicalise the process. But we must acknowledge that in the time it has taken us to get here, the government has allowed a vacuum to develop, and that has allowed fear and ignorance to prosper. The Cabinet Secretary says in the statement that some people are concerned about the potential impact on women and girls. It is essential that as this bill progresses, everyone's rights are protected. The Scottish Government made a commitment to proceed in a way that builds consensus, but the reality is discussion around this has become toxic for everyone involved, and this Government have not done enough to address that. So can the Cabinet Secretary please set out today how she intends to move forward in a way which brings people together, limits the opportunities for more hateful and abusive rhetoric, makes sure that we can look back on this moment with pride, and can the Cabinet Secretary please set out how can we turn this moment into something we can be proud of? Cabinet Secretary. Again, can I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for her remarks and for her questions. Um, so it has taken time to get to this point, and I think we all understand that the reasons for the, the complexity of the issue, the, the two consultations. Um, it, it's been a, a difficult process to get to this moment, and you know that that is the fact of the matter. Um, it is absolutely essential that everyone's rights are protected. And as I set out in my statement, uh, it's important, as, as important to set out what this bill doesn't do as it is to set out what it does do. So let me just remind people, this is about changing the process by which someone obtains a gender recognition certificate. It doesn't change any of the rights already held uh, under the Equality Act 2010. Um, th and that is important. And specifically in relation to uh, single-sex services, I uh, made very clear that those exceptions uh, where uh, transgender uh, people, even with a, a gender recognition certificate, can, in certain circumstances, be excluded from those services. So it's important we try to, to build consensus. Part of that is focusing on the evidence um, and on what the bill uh, is proposing, rather than some of the other matters that are not actually related uh, to, to this bill that sometimes circulate around discussion about this issue. Over the last few months, I've tried to meet with people who have pretty different views on this bill from those who wanted us to, uh, to, go, to go further uh, in relation to what's in the bill and those who didn't want the bill at all. Um, and I've tried in those discussions to focus it on what this bill is trying to do rather than some of the issues that are uh, not related to this bill. I'll continue to do that. I'll have an open door policy, but I think it's perhaps the responsibility of all of us in this chamber to also do that and to focus on the bill and, and, and trying to answer the questions as best as we can. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary wholeheartedly for her statement today. It is most welcome, as is the legislation which she publishes uh, this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank her for her clarity, because clarity is so important. And I echo her hope that we can conduct our debate and scrutiny of this bill within an atmosphere of informed respect. And I am confident that the solemn scrutiny of this parliament will get it right. I offer the unconditional support of my party for the reform of the existing Gender Recognition Act. The current process is harmful. It is illiberal and it fails to recognise the rights, the human rights of transgender people. Can I ask, does the Cabinet Secretary share my belief that it is wrong that we still have to ask people to submit their gender to a group of people they have never met? And does she also uh, agree with me that we need to design a system that is compassionate, simple, streamlined and allows people to live their lives free from discrimination. 
Cabinet Secretary. Um, yeah, yes, I would ag agree with that. And can I again thank Alex Cole Hamilton for, the, uh, for his questions and, and the tone of his contributions. Uh, it, it is um, important that we, we listen to the experiences, and I tried to give a couple of examples in my statement of the actual experience of people who are going through the process. I think it's interesting that if you look, and according to UK government figures, there are around 25,000 uh, people uh, who are part of the trans community here in Scotland. Around only about 600 of them actually have a gender recognition certificate. I see this bill as really the law catching up with how people are already living their lives because far more of those 25,000 people would want to obtain a gender recognition certificate. But the process, as outlined by, in my statement and by Alec Cole Hamilton, puts people off doing that. And you can understand why. So I think if we focus on that, uh, compassion is an important word here. And we have a good tradition here in this parliament and in Scotland of showing compassion. This is one of the most marginalised sections of our community. And this bill is important for them. And it's important about saying who we are as a nation as well. And I hope we can go forward on that basis. Joe Fitzpatrick to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As has been said, the debate around gender recognition can at times involve the use of language that some people find hurtful and derogatory. Following on from the remarks made by the presiding officer and all opposition spokespeople, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that, th that it is important for all of us, as Scotland's elected representatives, to set the tone for this debate by setting out our positions and listening carefully to the views of others in a respectful and courteous manner? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, I do, and I think we've made a good start to that, if, if, if you don't mind me saying, Presiding Officer, both by your introductory remarks and the tone of the comments and questions so far. And if we can keep that up, I think we can lead by example about dealing with this you know, very controversial and uh, you know, sometimes uh, difficult issues. But um, I think we've made a good start. There's been much discussion and debate about the bill and about the wider issues in relation to, to trans people from all of the issues that, that we, we know. The tone of debate on social media especially uh, has not been helpful. Uh, as I said in my, my statement, I think we can try to reset some of that uh, debate and the tone of it. As I said as well, I'll listen to the views of everyone and my door is open to members across this chamber. I made reference to some of the meetings that I had with stakeholders who have very differing views on the bill. And actually, even though there may have been you know, those who were most vehemently against the proposals, actually those meetings were very courteous, and I thank them uh, for that. Uh, this bill shouldn't be portrayed as, as having sides or pitting people against each other. This is something, as parliamentarians, we need to, to guard against. And therefore, I ask again that we in Parliament lead by example, as we're doing today, work together, set a tone of respectful discussion with a focus on the specific and actual proposals in this bill. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Equalities and Human Rights Commission said that simplifying the law on gender could have consequences for data collection, participation and drug testing in competitive sport, the criminal justice system and many other areas. Cabinet Secretary, are you convinced that the impact of this bill has been considered in all relevant areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, can I, can I thank you, uh, Alexander Stewart, for his uh, questions. Um, yes, I, I do think they have, but we continue to do so, and the Parliament will do so as part of its um, evidence gathering and looking and scrutinising the evidence. Obviously, I'm more than aware of the EHRC's uh, correspondence and communication about this, and I continue to correspond with them because I want to know uh, what the, kind of the, the evidence base that they have, they've looked at in order to change the position that's gone from obviously encouraging all of us uh, as our number one ask to include the demedicalisation process just a year ago at the, uh, for the Scottish Parliament elections to quite a different position. They're obviously entitled to do that, but I think we're also entitled to ask what the evidence base for that is, and that's something I'm sure that the committee will look at and this Parliament will look at. But uh, I'm happy to continue to keep that dialogue open. Rona Mackay to be followed by Claire Baker. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, I was glad to hear you highlight that transgender people face harassment for living their lives and that some social media comments are just not acceptable. I have a constituent with a transgender child who has found some of these comments and misinformation about what the Bill proposes to be very upsetting. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that tra transgender people should be supported to get on with their lives without their human rights being prejudiced? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I do agree with that. Trans people will, will just want to be able to get on with their lives as part of society without facing prejudice and harassment. And uh, they want their legal documentation to reflect the way they're already uh, living their lives. That's a reasonable thing uh, to ask, and I think we, we should all work towards that goal. And uh, as we've said a lot, the way we talk about these issues matters um, because we know that um, if the, the impact of um, a, a bad discourse around this issue does have a direct effect on the trans community. I said in my statement that there has there have been a, a, a rise in uh, hate crime with a transgender aggravator, and that's something we should all be concerned uh, about. And as with all debates on equality issues, it's really important to try to show empathy and understanding and to appreciate that other people's experiences and feelings may be different from our own, uh, but that doesn't make them less valid. So um, I uh, absolutely agree with Rona Mackay, and I think it's those voices of some of the most marginalised people in our society that we also need to listen to. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer. I want to ask about the interaction between Section 22 and the 2010 Act exemptions. Uh, the consultation on the draft bill did note that there was a question raised over whether Section 22 of the GRA could make it harder to use the general occupational requirement exemption. Um, in a letter to me in November, the Cabinet Secretary said the Government would consider if further exceptions to Section 22 should be made and if the Government would issue guidance on Section 22. There doesn't seem to be changes proposed in the Bill published today, so is the Cabinet Secretary intended to issue guidance, and would the guidance be issued during the process of the Bill? Cabinet Secretary. So, so first of all, on guidance, there will be guidance uh, issued uh, around a number of the, the elements of this Bill going forward. But, but let me just be clear on the general occupation um, uh, exceptions. That doesn't change because it's part of the Equality Act 2010. So uh, let me give you an example. If someone um, was uh, uh, working in the field of, of providing intimate care, uh, as is the case at the moment, it's absolutely uh, legitimate for a patient or someone who is receiving social care uh, to say who they do and who they don't want to provide that service. Um, and that is underpinned by the general occupation exception under the 2010 Equality Act. This bill does not change that at all. Um, it, that remains uh, as was. Um, and that was the important thing I said in my statement, that it does not this doesn't take any rights away. It doesn't uh, give any more responsibilities or, uh, or anybody any more rights. Um, what it does is to um, set out the, the change in the process for a GRC, but the elements that I've referred to um, don't change at all. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also welcome the tone of the debate from the comments across the whole chamber uh, today? It is very welcome indeed. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this bill seeks to realise the rights of trans people and does not change the rights of anyone else, and that by standing together as one, we further the rights of marginalised communities as well as for us all across society? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a, an important point um, made by Fulton McGregor. We have always achieved rights for each other um, if we stood together to strive for further rights and equality. Um, and this bill is about uh, achievement um, of, of current rights by allowing trans people to have better access to their existing rights for legal, legal gender recognition. It's not uh, about giving new rights to trans people. And as I've said before, the bill doesn't change the rights for anyone else. Uh, the process of, of being able to obtain uh, legal uh, recognition has um, been around for 18 years. Um, but the consultation has shown that the current system is a barrier uh, for, for many who would otherwise want to apply, and that's something this bill will resolve. Um, 
And I'll just let me stress again that the, the elements under the Equality Act 2010 and the protections there remain. The exceptions are important. The Scottish Government supports those exceptions and the Bill does not make any changes to them. Maggie Chapman to be called by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement. We know that trans people here in Scotland and indeed in all parts of the world are at heightened risk of violence, harassment and discrimination including human rights violations from bullying and verbal abuse to assault, rape and murder. Trans people are up to four times more likely to be the victim of violent crime than cis people. Can the Cabinet, sec the Cabinet Secretary has also been clear about what this reform bill does and, importantly, what it does not do. Can she reaffirm that the bill, as it progresses through Parliament, must not be used an, as an excuse to debate trans people's right to exist and can she also outline what we can all do to ensure we do not undermine the safety and rights of trans people? Cabinet Secretary. So I, I, I agree that this bill is not about whether or not trans people should be able to live their lives as they wish. Um, they, they have and they have those protections under the 2010 Equality Act explicitly. So I've had those for 12 years um, and they've had the ability to obtain a gender recognition certificate for close on 20 years. Um, it's important that we remember that these issues and the way we discuss them have real impacts on trans people. Um, hate crimes, as I said, with a transgender aggravator uh, recorded by Police Scotland have increased every year since 2014-15. Um, and that is um, not, not, not a good position and something that we need to change. And that's why it's so vital that we think about the way we talk about these issues. Our language matters uh, and how we conduct ourselves around this debate matters as well. Um, so I, I, this, I think it's also important um, that you know, we're not setting one set of people's rights against another. Uh, all rights matter. And um, I think we're stronger, actually, by promoting and strengthening everybody's rights. I think that makes us stronger as a parliament. It makes us stronger as a nation. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Tess White. Officer, um, I appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary states that the legislation um, and the policy of self-ID does not change the protections afforded by the Equality Act in terms of single-sex provision. This is the aspect of the bill that my constituents ask about the most. I understand that many organisations and institutions are already operating based on self-ID and that it may well be working for them, but that doesn't take away the need for female spaces for others. If the policy of self-ID is made law, how will the government ensure that single-sex spaces and services for the purposes of upholding dignity and privacy, for example, hospital wards, therapy groups, refuges and accommodation, are available to women and girls who need them and aren't diminished. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank Ruth McGuire for her uh, questions? So, um, I know that uh, so the issues that, um, that she has raised um, about the potential impact of the changes on single-sex spaces and single-sex services have been uh, quite, quite a focus. And I want to provide uh, further reassurance on this, which I've done uh, so far in my statement, which um, is why I've made clear today and in my engagement with people that the bill doesn't make any changes to the current position at all on the Equality Act protections. Uh, what it does is just simplify a process that has been in existence for 18 years and how a gender recognition certificate is obtained. Um, I think it's also important to say that trans people don't need to have a legal gender recognition uh, or a certificate in order to access facilities that align with their gender. Um, these are protections that trans people and everyone else have under the Equality Act 2010, and nothing in what we are proposing will change the Equality Act or current practices. Um, what the member outlines could be said of the, the current process, which trans people have been using for years, with no wide evidence of widespread harm, facilities like toilets and changing rooms, and although we may refer to them as single-sex spaces, are actually not legally defined as such under the Equality Act, and of course GRCs are not necessary to access them. But on the, 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 the wider point around healthcare provision and single-sex services, which could include uh, refugee, re, refugees, uh, ther therapy groups. The Equality Act provisions will uh, be unchanged. 
The Act sets out the protected characteristics and provides for exceptions. As I mentioned earlier on to Clare Baker, there is a general occupation requirement exception which can be applied when appropriate in relation to health services, for example, where intimate health and personal care services are uh, provided. Our public services have been managing these issues for many years. Uh, I think, um, as I understand, the EHRC is going to be revising guidance, which will perhaps help public bodies in terms of the, the practicalities of how they manage uh, these issues. But the, the reality is that they have been managing uh, these issues for, for many years. Um, but I'm happy to keep uh, discussing with Ruth McGuire and others uh, about the detail of these matters as we take the bill forward. Tess White to be followed by Karen Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Women's groups have felt sidelined during the consultation process and believed that the bill was a fait accompli before they'd had the opportunity to discuss it with the Scottish Government. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what changes have been made to the bill following discussions with women's groups, which took place as late as January 2022? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I think, thank Tess White for uh, her questions? Um, well, the, the bill isn't a fake, a fake accompli because it's just been introduced into this Parliament, and it will be for this Parliament, for yourselves, for everybody across this chamber, to scrutinise this bill, to look at the evidence, to hear all of the different views about it, and then to come to conclusions about whether the bill should be supported. That is our role as legislators. Uh, to scrutinise that evidence, and that will be important. I have tried, and I've spent a lot of time in meetings um, with people who have, are very supportive of the, the bill and with people who are vehemently opposed to the bill. And I've tried to go through some of the issues that, and concerns that they've raised. Um, and um, I, you know, whether those fears have been allayed, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think it's fair to say that some of the fears and concerns are not actually directly related to the proposals in the bill. They're more uh, of a general wider concern um, that this bill really um, doesn't change and are actually issues that you could say are, are uh, issues relating to um, the existing processes. But fears are fears, and we have to do what we can to address those concerns, and I'll continue to do that. In terms of the specific question of changes, so one of the important changes that actually did arise from listening to the concerns I was asked about how we will monitor the impact of this legislation. And uh, in response to that, we have introduced a, a new provision within the bill that requires annual reporting on the operation of the legislation. Ireland does that, so they've done that for seven years in terms of uh, the operation of legislation, including things like the number of GRCs issued. So that is a, a, a concrete example of having listened uh, to those uh, concerns and having changed the, the bill uh, in accordance. Karen Adam, to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, President Officer. I have spoken directly with young trans people and older trans people who have been through the process of obtaining a gender recognition certificate. They have fed back the importance of being able to access a GRC and that the current, current system creates barriers to do so. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the lived experience of those trans people are what is important and that simplifying this process will better support trans people to access their rights and live the life that they want? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, I, I do agree with that. And I think fundamentally this is about supporting people who are already living in their acquired gender. Um, it's clear from our consultations that many trans people who already have a right to legal gender recognition feel discouraged from applying under the current system for all the reasons we've talked about uh, during um, this statement. Um, and that those who have gone through the process have found it lengthy and invasive um, and intr intrusive. Uh, having their you know, life circumstances and very personal details considered by a, a tribunal. Um, the bill seeks to remove those barriers for people accessing their human rights by removing the requirement for medical diagnosis and, of course, reducing the period in which a trans person is currently required to evidence that they've lived in their acquired gender. But it's important to say that it will remain a serious and substantial process 
requiring applicants to make a statutory declaration that they intend to live the rest of their life in their acquired gender, and in making a false application, there will be a, a hefty uh, fine or indeed imprisonment in some circumstances. So, I'm also glad that, um, that uh, Karen Adam mentioned young people, as I've heard directly from young people who are very clear that they want to access these rights in an easier way, that there are too many barriers and that they want those rights when uh, they become adults so that they can get on and live their life uh, in the way that they want to in their acquired gender. Paul Keane to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I welcome publication of the bill and associate myself with the comments of my colleague and Duncan Glancy and indeed with comments across the chamber about the importance of respect in this debate. I seek clarity on the proposed timescales. Um, delay has led to a vacuum, uh, contributing to anxiety and, I think, toxicity of public discourse. As legislators, it is now our duty to scrutinise this bill, uh, and I believe that clarity on the anticipated time frame for each stage would be welcome. So is the Cabinet Secretary in a position to outline, outline this for Parliament? Cabinet Secretary, I hope you could hear that clearly. I, I, I think I got the, the gist of it. Um, um, I th well, it's Parliament that sets the, the, the timetable uh, for, for the bill, and obviously the, uh, the stage one debate, um, and then the, the stage two consideration, and then stage three will be set out uh, by uh, Parliament. The role of the committee, uh, the Equality Committee, is, is crucial here. Um, and really, now that the bill is introduced to Parliament, it's for Parliament uh, to, um, to agree that the timeframes um, for doing that, ensuring that there is you know, the, the proper uh, consultation and uh, ability for Parliament to look at all of the evidence. Uh, so hopefully that reassures Paul O'Kane that um, you know, we can get on with the, the job of um, getting uh, this, this bill um, scrutinised and debated. Um, now it's in Parliament. I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Pam Gossel. The ways in which the requirement for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria has become increasingly recognised as outdated and should no longer be considered as a mental disorder. Cabinet Secretary, would you like me to ask Ms Nicholl to repeat that? Uh, no, I, I think I got it. was about um, what well, I referred to in my statement about um, moving away from the... Uh, um, gender dysphoria being regarded as a mental disorder. Um, uh, and as I said in my statement, central really to our view of a, a balanced and proportionate way of improving the system is the removal of the requirement for a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria. For all the reasons that I've uh, outlined in uh, the statement and questions so far, uh, and the bill sets out that the application process will be based on a statutory declaration uh, made by the applicant. Um, I think we've also um, I've laid out why I think so few uh, members of the trans community have got a, a GRC for all of those reasons. The role of the World Health Organization, as I mentioned in my statement, in recategorising gender identity uh, related health, I think has been helpful. It, um, it was previously thought of as a mental health disorder. But they took this step to reflect that trans identity is not a condition of mental ill health and, and classifying them as such, of course, can, be, uh, can cause distress. Um, in a report published in December about reform of the Gender Recognition Act, um, it's also uh, worth noting that the House of Commons Women and Equality Select Committee called for substantial changes, including the demedicalising of the process. So I think there is recognition, not just here in Scotland, that the process needs reformed, um, and I think that's something we can lead the way on. I call Pam Gossel to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the Equality Impact Assessment for the proposals, a question is raised. Do you think that the policy impacts on men and women in different ways, to which the Scottish Government answer is no? Yet every single women's group that we have spoken to says it does. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that the Government has given proper consideration to the views of the women's groups? Cabinet Secretary. 
So, um, so let me just say, first of all, that um, the equality impact assessment has been an important part and a full equality impact assessment has been done. Um, on the issue of, I mean, I, I accept there are some women's groups who oppose this, there are some women who oppose this, but there are also many women and women's groups who support this, uh, not least some of the women's groups who provide support um, to some of our most vulnerable uh, women. I think also interesting when you look at the BBC poll, it, that really doesn't reflect that argument. The support for reform of the gender recognition process was highest among young people and among women. Women were far more sympathetic uh, to the need for a reformed process than men were, actually. So I think um, it would be, it, 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 it's important that we recognise that uh, women, yeah, have a range of views on this, but it's, it's not um, accurate to say that most women uh, oppose this uh, because it, the, the facts uh, suggest otherwise. What is important, though, is that the concerns that Pam Gosal has raised um, and that others have raised, that we take those seriously, that we don't ignore them, we don't dismiss them, and we address them. But we've also got to point out that many of those issues are not actually related to what this bill is about. It's a more uh, general concern. And, you know, some of it may be about, um, and I feel this as a, a woman uh, who has been campaigning uh, for women's equality for, for decades and as a feminist and as a, a mum of a daughter, I get frustrated sometimes that we're not making the progress for women's equality that we need to make. And, you know, but that's not the fault of the trans community. We've got work to do to make sure that we can progress women's equality. So, but let's keep talking about it and let's try to reassure where we can. And John Mason. Thank you. Uh, clearly, some health issues are linked more to biological sex, which cannot be changed, rather than to gender. So, will organisations involved in healthcare, like the NHS and like the prison service, be expected to keep records of both sex and gender? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, just to say, first of all, obviously, uh, people have been able to change their gender under the current uh, 2004 Act. So people have been able to do that. And uh, interestingly, the existing, uh, the existing gender recognition uh, legislation talks about gender and sex within the, the legislation. Um, the bill makes no changes to legal requirements or policy on data collection, none at all, or record keeping or the criminal justice system. All public bodies must ensure that their policies and practices are in line with the Equality Act 2010, which sets out protections for the protected characteristics, which includes sex and gender reassignment, and also the exceptions that protection single-sex services, among other things. And the bill uh, doesn't change any of that. Uh, on um, prisons um, obtaining a... And I think this is an important point to make, actually, um, that because I know that the issue of prisons has been raised uh, with uh, me and with others. Obtaining a gender recognition certificate does not automatically provide access to specific accommodation. The Scottish Prison Service already makes such decisions about accommodating trans prisoners in a way that seeks to protect both the well-being and rights of the individual as well as the welfare and rights of others. So, uh, basically, if they risk assess that someone should not be placed in the women's estate because they pose a risk, then they will not be. But similarly, if they uh, at risk assess that someone could be at risk themselves, then they will not place them in the place at risk. They're already doing that. But of course, the Scottish Prison Service is reviewing their policy uh, towards transgender prisoners to make sure that they continue uh, to get that right. Um, and that is what our public services should be doing. Thank you. That concludes Ministerial Statement on the introduction of the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next Ministerial Statement.